Welcome to the Probate Realtor Show, your one source for selling and buying real estate through trust and probate. Hear directly from the best attorneys and trusted advisors on how executors and administrators navigate the probate process in and out of court. Being a personal representative or successor trustee can be a daunting task, and often beneficiaries don't have a clear plan. Let us help you make the right decision for your clients, your family, and your legacy. And now, here's your host, the probate realtor himself, Matias Baker Mazzucci. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of our show. I am very excited today. We are talking to attorney Scott Ron. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matthias. Thanks for having me. Scott is a founding member of RMO LLP. They focus on trust and estate litigation, amongst many other things, I'm sure. And I wanted what we are going to talk about with Scott today is beneficiary rights in probate and trust, which is a very, very important topic that not many people know about. Uh, so, Scott, let me just start off right away with 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 defining the beneficiary rights. What are beneficiary rights in, if there are any? What are they in in trust and probate? Sure. Yeah, it's a it's a good broad question. Uh, essentially, beneficiary rights just mean what duties are owed to people who are intended to receive some benefit from someone's in estate. So you could be the beneficiary of a life insurance policy. Mm-hmm. I think most people are really familiar with that. You could be the beneficiary of someone's 401k, their retirement accounts. Mm-hmm. The beneficiary of a will or trust are some of the other most common known ways. And to dig in further to what the what the rights uh, of a beneficiary are, you know, essentially your rights are to whatever benefit that person set forth for you. So if you and your brother or sister are the beneficiaries of a life insurance policy, equal beneficiaries, then your rights are to one half of the life insurance proceeds. And it's essentially the same for a will or trust or a retirement plan or any other beneficial interest. The person who's giving away the interest gets to decide what your rights are, at least in terms of what you're going to receive. Now, the rights that go beyond that simple answer are much more involved and include things like you have a right to an accounting right? So Mm -hmm. that you know that you're getting what you're supposed to. So you as a, for example, as a beneficiary of a will or a trust, you have a right to ask the administrator or executor of a will or a trustee of a trust to detail for you what assets were in the trust, you know, what expenses have been paid and what happened to the trust assets such that what you're receiving is fair. So if you start with, I like to use nice round numbers. If the trust starts with a million dollars, it has a hundred thousand dollars in expenses and you and your two siblings Mm -hmm. are equal beneficiaries under that trust. The accounting should show the million dollars, the hundred thousand dollars going out and each of you getting $300,000, which would total the 1 million. So you also have rights beyond that to be treated fairly, to be treated equally for the, for the fiduciary not to play favorites, for the fiduciary not to engage in self-dealing, and a, a bunch of other rights that come along with being the beneficiary of a structure that is fiduciary in nature. Thank you very much for elucidating, elucidating that uh very important aspect of, of, of being a beneficiary. Now, as a beneficiary, uh, I feel that we often talk about fiduciary duties and fiduciary responsibilities. So what are the things that somebody who is a beneficiary can observe and say, look, this is a red flag, obviously, apart from the obvious thing, like somebody running away with the money. <laughs> but you know, if, it, if, it's not, if it's not exactly that, can, if somebody suspects wrongdoing, uh, what are some of the red flags that you've encountered in your practice that, that somebody can look out for? There are so many red flags, Matthias. Mm-hmm. So, so many. Uh, I think the first one, and you know, we often talk with 
clients who are going through this about this, you know, trust your gut, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so many of us give people the benefit of the doubt when we shouldn't, right? If you feel that something is off, you know, and oftentimes it, it starts before, you know, our loved one passes and the will or trust even really come into play. Mm -hmm. right? If you think someone's stealing money, you know, investigate, do your diligence, ask questions, right? Gather information. So, you know, some of the things that we see pre-death are, mm -hmm. you know, our loved ones, you know, our elderly loved ones suddenly are complaining that they don't have money, right? They mm -hmm. were fine, right? They had plenty of money, you know, they were eating well, and now they're not eating well, or they're, you know, rationing, and they're saying, you know, well, I don't have any money, I don't have any money. And you have to start to ask why, right? Why do they not suddenly not have money? You know, after the person deceases and, you know, someone's in charge of managing their affairs, you know, if you think that something's untoward again, you know, trust your gut, investigate. If, you know, you see that, you know, your brother or sister who, you know, never had anything is suddenly driving, you know, a, a new, <laughs> you know, Range Rover or, you know, a Mercedes, um, they're suddenly taking trips, you know, they're wearing jewelry that looks an awful lot like mom's, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes these things are, are pretty obvious. Um, some of them require a little bit more, more diligence. Um, ask for information right? Ask for copies of the bank records, right? The bank statements, uh, you know, to do a quick title search on the properties to make sure that they're, you know, not, they haven't been taken by someone. And these are things that we help people do all the time. So someone will call and say, you know, I'm concerned that my brother or sister, you know, has taken, you know, mom and dad's house. So we'll do a quick title search and find out. And sometimes they're right. Or sometimes they, you know, they've done you know, sneaky things like put a deed of trust on mom's house, you know, mm -hmm. before she died. And it's, you know, the, the deed of trust is going to gobble up all the equity or they've taken out a reverse mortgage and all the money's being taken out, you know, was taken out the back. Right. So there, there are all kinds of different things, but I think the most important thing is, is to trust your gut and then, you know, do the diligence, either do it yourself or, you know, call us and, you know, it's what we do all day, every day. Uh, and just dig into some of these things. But, you know, the number of people that we talk to, you know, every week that say, you know, I knew this was happening, right? Or mm -hmm. I knew this was going to happen, right? The, everybody knows their family better than we do, right? right. We do a really good job at, you know, getting as close to fully experiencing their life as they did. Mm -hmm. But they grew up with their brother or sister, right? They grew up with their step parent, right? And they know their personalities, right? They've seen them, you know, alligator arm the check at every dinner, <laughs> right? They've seen yeah. them, you know, take money from mom or dad over the course of 30 or 40 years, right? right. They know who these people are. They've seen all the, you know, the little, the thousand cuts, right? So, you know, your, your gut is going to be much more well-informed and in tune to who these people are and what they've done, you know, and then we can help you, you know, come to finality on a, on a decision on what the best next steps are to make sure we're addressing it. Thank you for that. So let's say that I have become suspect of something that's happening with, you know, as a beneficiary, um, and I'm starting to take the steps, the obvious steps, you know, you, you, I obviously I wouldn't say I'm I'm looking at this from you know a lot of our audience is not directly involved with trust and probate unless they uh, they find themselves in the situation you know so they're not experts about doing title search searches or things like that so when is the time to reach out to you to be like okay I gotta call Scott now you know this is like so I reach out to a sibling and I say can I see a bank account and and everything's in shamble, there's like receipts, and I don't know, they don't even know what's going on, or they are presenting a front that is as confusing to masquerade some sort of, of nefarious doing. When is the time to reach out to someone like you? We always hope that it's as early as possible, mm -hmm. because the reality is it's much easier to stop a fraud stop a theft mm -hmm. than it is to claw back those assets and address or redress the wrong right. that's happened. So it, the sooner we can get involved, 
often it's the case that once we get involved and we're shining our you know bright flashlight you know our giant beam of light Mm -hmm. on the situation you know that things that might have happened had we not been involved tend to not happen right because they know somebody's watching them right Right? whereas if it's just a family member they're like eh, i don't think they're going to do anything so you know i'm going to take i'm going to take a little bit right they take one cookie and then they take two cookies and then they take the whole cookie jar so Mm -hmm. you know us just being involved is often a deterrent to those kinds of things and the reality is is that even when it's not a deterrent as soon as something happens then you're not running out trying to find a lawyer right getting them up to speed getting them to court we're here right and when those things happen we're at the ready you know we can get our ex-party papers together we can get into court swiftly you know to have those people removed have the harm stopped before it becomes unmanageable and people are reluctant to hire counsel right they you know they hope that it doesn't go to the point where they need to have a lawyer right I get that right i understand that um you know coming to the realization that you have to hire a lawyer to you know tackle a family affair it's a difficult it's a difficult decision to make um it's difficult to process and admit that but the reality is is you know you're going to be better off for having somebody in your corner when you need them than just letting things happen and hoping that they don't. I can certainly agree with that 100%. It's the sooner the better if you suspect. But let's hypothetically say that somebody is, as, as it often happens, just like the scenario is like, you know what, it's a family member. I don't want to get the attorneys involved, et cetera, et cetera. But then it becomes the situation um, escalates to a point where they're like, okay, a lot of damage has been done already. So they reach out to you and a lot of damage has been done already. So what I'm building up to is the importance that forensic accounting and all the steps that you would do, like you, you mentioned, you know, the removal of the fiduciary, you know, whoever that person may be or successor trustee. Can you, can you walk our audience through, you know, what are the steps when I come to you and I say, Scott, okay, I've got a mess on my hands. All of this is going on. I already know that the money's gone probably. They try to sell the, the, the house to, to somebody for half the price to make a deal, to resell it, or whatever the situation is. What do you do when, that, when the situation is, is escalated to that point? A couple of things. I mean, the, the great thing about real estate is that you can tie it up, right, and help right. protect it by initiating an action and mm-hmm. then putting a Liz Pendens on it, you know, putting a cloud on the title, which right. makes it difficult for them to to sell it to a bona fide purchaser. So that's one of the first things that we look at if we run into a situation, as you've described it, is we try to protect as much of what's left as we possibly can. Right. And that is a really simple way um, in a relatively cost-effective way, you know, filing suit, recording a Liz Pendens on the property to protect it from being dissipated. Uh, The other side is what you mentioned with the forensic accountants, and we love our forensic accounting team. I am Mm -hmm. not an accountant, right? Right. I am a probate litigator. I am the person that you want in court explaining the forensic accounting Mm -hmm. conclusions to the court, but the forensic accountants are the ones who are going to sit in that witness chair and explain the minutiae to the court as to how the assets moved from you know, mom or dad's checking account to bad sister, bad brother, bad step parent. And now how that money was then moved from that account to this piece of property and how that piece of property really belongs to the estate and should come back. So, you know, the forensics work hand in hand with us to put all the pieces together, right? They're the ones who tie up all of those well, I should say, kind of piece back together all those hanging chads <laughs> to create, right. you know, to create the picture that we want, you know, hand in hand with us because we're the ones who have the authority to go out and get the information. So, you know, we get the information in part from the other parties, um, but also through our subpoena power. So, you know, subpoenaing bank records, financial institution records, accountants records, uh, et cetera, to to piece together all of the the facts that we need to show where the money started, where it ended up, 
And then we get to argue over, you know, what should come back and why. That makes total sense. Now you said something very important in your answer, which is, you know, I'm not an accountant, I'm a probate litigator. So you want me in court. And I think the more I explore, you know, the more we explore professionalism in, in, in this particular arena, it, it, it really um, speaks volume of how important it is for people to stay in their lane and be very good at what they do and not be a jack of all trades and say, yeah, I'll help you with the accountant. Yeah, sure. You need this. I could do it, you know, paint your house and whatever. <laughs> and <laughs> I think that, you know, so my question is, since you, you know, you, you, you're very specific at what you do, which is key, when people need help from, from other people and they say, you know, I need help for this and that, et cetera, like the help of accounting, you can facilitate that connection, correct? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I like to compare our firm here, RMO, to my experience in big law. You know, mm -hmm. I was a partner in, you know, an AMLAW firm before I started this firm and almost 10 years ago. And I had 900 partners. We had yeah. 2,000 lawyers and they're good lawyers, right? Good lawyers, smart people. But the community that we have formed during that time period and after, mm -hmm. and the community that you know, we retained and continue to grow, it's all those people that you mentioned. So we don't do taxes, for example, right. we're not tax lawyers, right? I, we don't yeah. dabble in the internal revenue code. We don't mess with the FTB, right? So if there are tax issues, we consult with tax lawyers right? Or with our clients' tax lawyers or our clients' CPAs. And those are the people who should be doing that, right? Yeah. I, I and we should be doing the litigation, the dispute, mm -hmm. the courtroom work, because that's our unique ability. That's who we are. That's what we're really good at. You don't want me doing your taxes, right? Yeah. Nor do you want your tax lawyer doing your litigation, right? Yes. And, you know, what we have found over, you know, the past couple decades of doing this is that it ensures that the client gets the best result for the least amount of money and usually in the least amount of time, which is what they all want, right? And which is what we want for them. So, you know, by being surgically laser focused on probate litigation, you know, it allows us to present a streamlined team of people who are laser focused again on getting that dispute done for you and getting you the best result we possibly can in the least amount of time for the least amount of money. And that is, that is our value proposition. You know, I, 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 I'll never forget this happened to me years ago. I was hosting an open house and I was talking to somebody and I was trying to explain to them, you know, what I do, you know, selling real estate through trust and probate. And I can't not tell you how relieving it was when it came to me, this in my mind, and I just said, I'm not your neighborhood realtor. That's what I said. It sounds silly, but yeah. it remind you brought this to mind right now to me because you talked about, you know, like you want to be focused. You want to be like exactly at what you do. And yep. that's where you can serve your clients the best. Exactly. So before, let, let, me, let me ask you another question. Like let's reverse this slightly because uh, it's a very fascinating, um, fascinating subject. Let's say, now, from the point of view of the fiduciary, when they are wrongly accused of wrongdoing, now, is that something that falls within your, your practice area? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Anything so, that yeah. falls into the into probate court. So whether it's a beneficiary pursuing a fiduciary or mm -hmm. a fiduciary who's being accused of wrongdoing and having to, to defend themselves. Right. So quickly, let me, let me ask you, what are the steps that you feel that a fiduciary should be taking if they have been wrongly accused and they reach out to you, you know, what are the things that you tell them? They reach out to you and say, Scott, look, I'm, my siblings are going crazy. They're telling me that I'm doing all these things wrong when I'm not. I think they're just jealous or whatever. How do you approach that differently? Sure. Being a fiduciary, whether a trustee, executor or other, it's like having a giant target on your back, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's no good deed goes unpunished because mm -hmm. everybody is gunning for you because they want something and you got it, right? And you can't administer it fast enough. You can't get it into their hands fast enough. They always think that whatever the expenses are are too high, 
right? And it's it's a really difficult role to be in. So you know, we with our fiduciary clients, you know, spend a, a significant amount of time helping them understand what their duties are, mm-hmm. right? And what their duties aren't. But one of the most important things we often talk our fiduciary clients through is the need to communicate, right? And the need to share information, because I think a lot of, especially family fiduciaries, you know, they just want to put up walls, right? They feel attacked, right? Mm -hmm. Not to minimize their feelings because they're feeling those things justifiably so. But the reality is, is the best way to take down the temperature on these issues 99 times out of 100 is to open up the books and show everybody that, look, there's nothing nefarious going on here, Mm -hmm. right? I'm doing my job. I'm doing it well. And it provides you protection, right? When you show somebody, you know, look, this is what I'm doing in my administration. These are the reasons why I'm doing it. And somebody comes back later and says, oh, I didn't like the result of that. You can go back and say, well, look, I kept you fully apprised of what was going on, why it was going on. There were no objections, right? And it's, you know, it gives us an opportunity to, you know, manage the narrative with not only our, our clients, but with the people that are throwing barbs at them. And mm-hmm. if we've got good counsel on the other side, you know, it gives us the ability to work with them to say, you know, these are all the reasons why there's no there there. So, and in the cases where they're, you know, people make mistakes because they do, right? Most family fiduciaries are not, you know, professionals and don't do this for a living and they make mistakes. Right. Uh, and perhaps they pay things that they shouldn't have or, you know, they've moved money in a way that, you know, maybe they shouldn't have. But our ability to come in and help them understand what they should have done and how maybe this isn't consistent with that also helps us get those issues resolved more quickly because we can clean them up more quickly. And that's better for everyone, right? It's better for our client. It's better for the beneficiaries, right? Because it's bringing this administration to a close more quickly, which is, again, what everybody wants. Very nice. Thank you so much for explaining that. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about your journey now. I've looked at you know, your website, obviously read your bio. I love the, the, the um, you know, the line that says that you're influenced by your mid- Midwest roots and a close, a close relationship to your grandmother. Can you talk about that please, a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I grew up farming in the Midwest. My grandparents had a dairy farm. Nice. Uh, um, my, actually, my grandparents on both sides were farmers, uh, but I really spent a lot of time with my mom's mom, my, my grandma Mary. Um, and yeah, it was just, you know, taking care of old people and the whole concept of legacy. She had inherited her farm from her grandparents. Oh, wow. Um, and it's still in the family today with, with a cousin, um, which is, I think, you know, it was really important to my family and just, you know, having those experiences in, seeing how family takes care of family and how that is really what's important and is often what's driving a lot of this, right? There's always money involved, right? Mm -hmm. People, people fight over very little, they fight over a lot, you know, it it really, it often doesn't matter whether it's a lot of money or a little bit of money, um, because there are all kinds of feelings attached to this human, human attachment to it. So, you know, it's just really informative and, you know, I, I take my own family experiences and I share them with clients because I, I tell them, you know, look, it only takes one family member to disrupt this apple cart. And every family has one, right? Every family mm-hmm. has someone who, you know, has always been a little greedier, always expected a little bit more, always took more than they should have. And it's okay, right? You're not alone. Right. And, and We understand these personalities (laughs) and the personality deficiencies that come along with it and and kind of how to manage those people through these things. And I think it's really reassuring and relieving to our clients to know that, you know, we have a plan, we have a strategy, we have experience and all those things, you know, we're going to hold their hand and, and get them through this. That's wonderful. Very, very nice. Now, let me ask you one more question about the, your journey 
when you went to law school, did you want to be in probate? I love to ask that question. What, <laughs> what, what, what was your opinion? Of? I, I don't think most people really think about probate when they go to law school. Mm -hmm. we, we all have to take wills and trusts. And, and I have to tell you, I thought it was fascinating, right. uh, a fascinating practice area. We covered the Anna Nicole Smith case. Oh, wow. uh, which, you know, obviously was, you know, fodder for tabloid and, and mainstream media headlines. Right. So I always thought it was a fascinating practice area, but there just aren't a ton of opportunities coming out of law school for that kind of work. So I, yeah. like many people, you know, went to, you know, a bigger firm, but I had the opportunity when I was a, a baby lawyer, I think I was a second year, a probate case came in for one of the large financial institutions that we represented and my partner brought it to me and said, it's weird. It's probate. It's got its own rules. You'll smart, you're smart. You'll figure it out. Um, and I figured it out and got a good result. Um, and then from that became, you know, the probate expert because I had, you know, a little bit of probate experience and we had a trust in the States department. So I got some training there, but then I moved to, you know, a bigger national firm that had a bona fide trust in the States practice. And I just kept steering my ship in this direction. And, here we are today, you know, 20, 21 years later, 21 years barred. And, you know, we, we always joke, you know, it's, it's an overnight success, you know, a couple decades in the making. <laughs> I love it. That's wonderful. Okay. Before I let you go, I have, I, I always end my show this way. I have um, a list of 30 questions. I want you to pick a random number right. and I will ask you that question. 17. 17. Okay, why were you given your name? Oh my goodness, that is a great question. I believe it was a character on a TV show that my mom liked. <laughs> there was awesome. another name from another TV sh show that she liked as well. I believe it was Brian. And I was okay. going to be Brian. And then when I was born, I was the other character and not Brian. Uh, that's awesome. I love it. Thank you very much for sharing. And, and, and it's been such a pleasure to have you. Uh, uh, there's something else that I actually want to say before I let you go. I absolutely love your website. I, I visit a lot, of, a lot of websites that are related to trust and probate estate planning and probate litigation. And what you guys have done, it's phenomenal. And so I want to let, uh, my audience to know that if they have any questions, there are videos there are blog posts, there, are, there is a wealth of information there. Seriously, can you please give the URL to our audience, even to those that are listening? Yeah, sure. It's rmolawyers.com. And we did really try to build a dossier of easily digestible answers to some of the most frequent questions that people ask about this stuff, because it's not something people do every day. True. True. Um, great. So before I let you go now, I'm going to, um, this time I, I promise it, it, we, we will wrap it up. Um, some people would be, uh, what is the best way to get a hold of you, Scott, when somebody needs you? Sure. Through, through the website. Uh, okay. You can always come to the website and find us there. Otherwise, you can always just email me directly. I, my email is ron, S R A H N S at armolawyers.com, or you can just call the main line. 424-320-9444. Happy to help however we can. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. I feel like we only scratched the surface of your wealth of knowledge on this subject matter. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and we will see you on the next episode. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Andres.